Hi everybody, this is Mrs. Poindexter and we are going to go over some highlights in uh, chapters 4 and 5 of the ATI Nursing Leadership and Management book. And we're going to focus on clients' needs in terms of safety and infection control. Chapter 4 is going to be focusing on maintaining a safe environment. Now please don't allow this recording to be a substitute for reviewing chapter 4 because I'm not going to cover everything that's in chapter 4. Just highlight um, some important points that I don't want you to overlook. So in terms of infection control, um, hand hygiene is always going to be the first line in terms of preventing the spread of infection. There are other disease processes though uh, that will require additional um, isolation in terms of um, precautions. So just make sure that you are familiar with the different types and these pictures right here uh, kind of remind you what different uh, diseases um, or illnesses um, that actually require different types of precaution. When we're talking about the safe use of equipment, some highlighted points, just make sure that equipment is set and functioning properly. For example, O2, every time you go in with a patient who has O2, make sure that it's running properly and set to the prescribed dose. Um, make sure that you unplug equipment by pulling at the plug and at the cord. And if for some reason any equipment is not functioning the way it's supposed to, that it is actually taken out of service and typically that's done with a procedure called lockout tagout um, in accordance to facility policy. So you know um, we've always talked from day one about falls so again just make sure you know your patient population and any comorbid, uh, comorbid, comorbidities they may have. Um, think of your elderly, those with diabetic neuropathy, urinary frequency, gait and balance problems like Parkinson's, osteoporosis, and arthritis, those with cognitive functions, and look at the medications that your patients are taking um, that may cause orthostatic hypertension or drowsiness. And obviously, um, always reassessing your patients is going to be very important. Prevention is key. Fall risk assessments and continue assessment. Have the bed low. Um, call light within reach, non-skid slippers or shoes, the floor is free of clutter, sensors for patients who attempt to get up without assistance, and lock wheels on beds, wheelchairs, or tables uh, to prevent uh, falls during transfer. And again, these are just some recommendations. Your chapter 4 goes into um, more detail in a longer list. So seizure precautions, uh, make sure if you have patients on seizure precautions that rescue equipment is at bedside, which includes O2 and oral airway suction. Um, have their room assignment near the nurse's station. If there are family, make sure that they um, are educated. So some things they need to make sure is not to restrain somebody who's having a seizure. Um, if the person's having a seizure, not in bed, to show them how to lower a patient safely to the ground, remove any furniture that may get in the way, put the patient um, in on their side, which is a recovery position, have their head slightly flexed forward, and loosen any clothing. Um, just to kind of, so it's not restrictive to them or may pose injury to them. If you do witness a person who is having a seizure, stay with them at all time during the duration. Um, following a seizure, we need to provide um, a patient a quiet environment for recovery. As a nurse, some of the things that you need to document, um, especially if you witness a seizure, is to include any precipitating behaviors. Um, this can include an aura. Some individuals kind of get a sense that a seizure is coming on. Um, description of the seizures, any movements, any injuries that may have been sustained during the seizure, the length of the seizure, and any um, postical state, which is basically an altered um, level of consciousness that follows a seizure, and this can last for a short period of time or a longer period of time. And obviously, most importantly, you want to make sure that you report the seizure to the provider. When we talk about seclusion and restraints, uh, make sure that there's an actual prescription done by the physician. The physician needs to do a face-to-face -face assessment to make sure um, 
that uh, seclusion or restraints are actually warranted. Make sure you have the actual prescription, typically within one hour um, of the physician prescribing it. The prescription needs to specify the reason for restraints, the type of restraints, location of the restraint, um, how long they can be used, and type of behavior that warrants the use of the restraints. And typically they need to be rewritten every 24 hours or according to your facility policy, and also needs to specify the type of restraint. Restraints should be used for the shortest duration necessary and they should only um, be used if other less restrictive measures have failed and it's for the physical protection of the client or the protection of the client or staff um, and PR restraints are not permitted so restraints or seclusion should never be used to say punish a patient. Nurses' responsibilities, here are just some highlights. You need to make sure that you conduct neurosensory, check, neurosensory checks every two hours or according to facility policy. You need to look at the circulation, sensation, and mobility. Make sure there's a quick release knot to tie the restraint to the bed frame, not to movable parts like the railings. Make sure that restraints are loose enough for range of motion and have enough room to fit two fingers between the device and the client. Regular assessments um, for the need of the restraints and never leave them unattended without the restraints if they need to have the restraints on. Fire safety, um, know the basics in terms of the different type of extinguishers. Typically the ones you'll see in hospitals are um, A, B, and C. And make sure you know um, your procedures in terms if there is a fire, race, you rescue um, patients, get them out, alarm, um, confine the fire and try to extinguish it if it's within your means and capability to how you actually use an extinguisher use the pass which is pull the pin aim at the base of the fire squeeze the handle and sweep side to side so chapter five some facility protocols incident reports uh, typically reports um, examples would be like medication errors all the way to loss of property it is really important uh, to do incident reporting because it's a way for internal investigations um, that can affect a client um, and even staff. Um, in most states, they cannot be subpoenaed by clients or used as evidence in lawsuits as long as proper safeguards are in place. But if you do enough searches, you will find at times it still is admissible in court. But however, um, some of these um, safeguards are they need to be done within 24 hours of the incident. Now the incident report is not placed or mentioned in the patient's health record. Um, however, um, a description of the incident should be reported factually in their health record. Do not share um, with, a fa with the patient that an incident report was even done. Um, and when you do an incident report, it needs to be objective and complete. You need to state all the facts. Don't, you know, if there's interventions, make sure you include every detail, but it needs to just be factual. But again, um, this is for internal investigation and it helps with quality measures to prevent uh, such incidents down the road. Know your different categories when it comes to triaging uh, with mass casualties. Um, classes are four from emergent to expectant. Class one has highest priority with life-threatening injuries with high possibility of survival once they are stabilized. To urgent, which is second highest priority. Um, they have major injuries that are not yet life-threatening and they can wait up to 60 minutes for treatment. The next is class 3, which is non-urgent. Uh, these are with minor injuries um, that do not need immediate attention to unfortunately our expectant, which is our lowest class, which is class 4. They have the lowest priority. They're not expected to live um, and will be allowed to die naturally. Comfort, comfort measures can be provided, but no curative. So that's it. Um, again, this is just a recap. Do not use this as a substitute for the chapters, but just some highlights um, that I feel is necessary for you to know. Take care.